Welcome back, my friends, to The Jake Bro Show. Today, we are joined with a very thoughtful, very pensive guest. I'm excited to have him on the channel. He was born in Soviet Russia, currently lives in London, and is a British citizen. He is a philosopher who makes fantastic content on YouTube. I'm excited to uh, have him share his ideas and his thoughts about Putin and this war. His name is Vlad Vexler. Would you please uh, introduce yourself to the audience? Hi, Jake. It's lovely to be with you, everybody. Um, I'm Vlad. I live here in London. I'm a political philosopher. A big part of my life, and I sometimes like to throw that in straight away. Sometimes I'm slow to share it. A big part of my life has been having a serious health condition. And uh, that means that my life is timed in a quite a extraordinary and unusual way. Now, as I come in into my early um, 40s, I, uh, most of my work off YouTube is in political and moral philosophy. And I had, I thought, just at the turn of the year, before the war, to begin being quite a bit more intentional on YouTube. And that's led to extraordinary conversations, extraordinary connections, and uh, amazing communities coming together. So I'm so, so happy to be, to be here speaking with you, Jake. Let's get a little bit more of your backstory. Uh, when did you leave Russia? And uh, when was maybe the last time you visited? I left the Soviet Union not Russia. I left the Soviet Union, I think, about a year before it collapsed uh, in 1990. And that was part of this extraordinary experiment in blood and belonging when people who were Jewish or sufficiently Jewish were trying to escape the Soviet Union for Israel. Um, and the majority of the people who were um, around me at that time were running away for economic reasons. The Soviet Union was in considerable decay. There were food shortages. Most basic foodstuffs were not available in Moscow. And so people were running away. I'm myself half um, Jewish, um, which isn't clear, uh, you know, isn't clear that, that should qualify me <laughs> to move. But my family managed, uh, my family managed to go. And uh it was an extraordinary experience. At that time, everybody in the Soviet Union that I knew idealized the West. The West was felt a uh, utopia. Um, I even felt that there were no social problems in the West, not just that the economies were doing well, but that people didn't quarrel and that people's inner worlds were, um, you know, remarkable. And Arriving in Israel was my first experience, uh, my first experience of, of the West. And I remember that trip very, very well. We went via Hungary and then an El Al flight from Budapest to Tel Aviv, accompanied by F-16s, and then thousands of people meeting us at the airport, strangers greeting their um, uh, new fellow citizens. And eventually my family moved to the UK in the mid-90s. And then of my own bat since then, I've lived mostly in the UK and a bit in Tonga and in Australia for a few years. And I've kept going back to Russia. So I, I saw Russia in the early 90s when it was in sort of quasi-anarchic decay. I saw Russia in the early Putin period. The last couple of times I went was 2017 and 2018. I went for a funeral and a memorial of a, a family member who was prominent in, in Soviet cinema and in Russian cinema, which was another sort of um, alleyway into seeing how the culture was doing and how the culture was responding to the extraordinary political developments. And throughout that period, I followed Putin. I started following Putin closely in the late 90s um, and was intensely critical from the beginning. And um, most of my experience of Putin analysis in the early days was from a Russian television channel called NTV, which was shut down under Putin in 2001. 
And it was viscerally critical of Putin at that time, even when many people in the West were still sympathetic to him. And the, the lead journalist from that channel is actually now an honorary Ukrainian. His name is Evgeny Kisilov, and he he's now feels himself to be a Ukrainian journalist. So that's the story. I've only discovered your channel maybe a couple of months ago, and I've been binging your content, but you have for quite a time quite a while been laser focused on the problems with Russia and specifically Vladimir Putin. Uh, potentially the video that you made that I've enjoyed the most so far is contrasting the difference between old Soviet propaganda and the, the new style of Putin propaganda coming out of Moscow. For our audience who haven't seen that video, can you explain the difference between uh, Kremlin propaganda 30, 40 years ago and Kremlin propaganda today? It's quite a basic um, difference. Soviet propaganda tried to persuade you of an alternate picture of reality, tried to paint a world and invited you to believe in it. Now, at the very end of the Soviet project, nobody could believe in it. So it was a kind of a game. Um, but the idea was still that there was some kind of ideological vision and that was the right thing to believe in. When I was at school, I had to say how much I loved Lenin. I loved Lenin more than my relatives. So that was the story. They were trying to persuade you of a kind of um, fantasy, historical fantasy of deliverance from social and economic problems via Marxist-Leninism. Putin's propaganda doesn't try to persuade you of an alternate reality that you should believe in. It tries to manipulate your sense of reality. It basically tries to saturate the informational environment with incompatible pictures of reality. And the aim isn't to persuade you of anything, isn't to initiate you into kind of political mobilization, into kind of vision. The aim is to depoliticize you, to make you feel, well, this is too complex for me to engage in and make you feel that maybe there isn't such a thing as an unqualifiedly statable truth about anything. Soviet propaganda was clear. This is the truth. And if you don't believe in that, you're wrong. Putin propaganda does not try to tell you, we have the story here. This is what you believe. Putin propaganda tries to tell you, look, this is a very complex world and there are claims and counterclaims. And then it tries to pump information at you from all directions. And the idea is that you simply give up on politics. That's the key aspiration. And it's been working very tragically, effectively. Um, until a few days ago, when the first issue ever in my experience came up, on which the propaganda began to splatter, and that's mobilization. Because they were trying to saturate the informational environment with incompatible messages about mobilization. And normally, that would sort of confuse and pacify people. But on this occasion, it sounded to people like, you're going to take us away and we're going to die, or you're not going to take us away, we're not going to die. We're going to die, we're not going to die. So, so it did the opposite. It actually uh, made people anxious and made people feel the opposite to the feeling that was desired, which is to get them to retire to the couch. But that doesn't mean the machine has cracked. The propaganda machine is still intact. It's just had a wobble. As, as an American, I think I've felt this uh, increase in confusion and chaos, especially since 2014, after Putin annexed Crimea, the first round of sanctions were put on Russia. I think it's at that point in 2014 that Putin had already decided he was going for all of Ukraine. Uh, they were holding these exercises on the border every year, amassing hundreds of thousands of soldiers, war gaming, prepping. Uh, Peace was never an option. Putin, in my opinion, was always going for Kyiv. They wanted control of the whole country. So with this increase in this new style of confusion, this propaganda coming out of the Kremlin, what should Western governments and Western media be doing? How should they be uh, responding to it that maybe they're not doing effectively up until this point? Well, I think the first thing is to first of all, understand 
that it's real and try to understand how it works, but also try to see it for what it is, um, not make it bigger than it is. I think that since 2014, in a very self-conscious way, it's been Russian foreign policy to destabilize democracies that were participating in the sanctions regime against Russia. And destabilization was the aim. Chaos was the aim. Loss of trust, loss of faith in democracy was the aim. The aim has never been to take sides. Um, so it, it's important to understand that um, it, it's completely devoid of loyalty, this sort of Russian intervention. If it fits them to go for Le Pen or uh, Trump for a few weeks, they will do that. If it then fits them to go for Biden, indeed, for some bizarre reason, they will do that too. So we shouldn't think too much of Russians as being sort of tied to and supporting ongoingly political, particular political candidates. Um, although sometimes they would support somebody for a period of months, but that can always change. I think that short of dealing with what they're up to technically, there's a kind of important political lesson about how we should respond. And that's about understanding what their main sort of goal is. And the goal is probably that we freak out about their interference. And so what I like to say is that the point of the interference isn't so that the interference does damage to us, but that so, so that it seeds panic, conflict, and confusion. And that, our reaction to interference, is then what damages our democracy. So my advice around this is to do the opposite of what we're often doing, which is to try to depoliticize our way of understanding Russian interference in our societies. And that's really, really very difficult for us to do because we have got culture wars in the West between folks who play down Russian interference and indeed even say that it's not real and folks who take a very maximalist view of it, which may exaggerate its role and harm us that way too because the effect of that often is that we forget that some of the problems we're dealing with are homegrown. And that's an important point, too. The Russians rarely try to seed completely new problems. They pay attention to what already divides us and then try to maximize that. So that's a kind of a the beginning of a conversation, I think, about how we, we talk about responding to the way they've, they've been interfering and the way they're going to try to continue interfering in our democracies. I mean, we don't want to say, basically, that everything that's wrong with our democracy is an expression of malign foreign interference on the one hand. On the other hand, we want to acknowledge interference when it's real, and we want to respond to it and protect ourselves from it. And above all, we want to not let it divide us. And that's a very difficult challenge. You mentioned mobilization and how this has had a dramatic change in the way that ordinary Russians are responding to their governments. It looks like for the first time in 20 years, Vladimir Putin doesn't appear invincible to the broad spectrum of his people. Can you talk about how this is affecting the Russian people and Russian society since mobilization was announced? So my feeling is that it, it's affecting them um, as though there's somebody who's just waking up, opening one eye, and then going back to sleep. Something irreversible has shifted, but fundamentally they're still asleep. Um, and so why do I say that, even though we're seeing protests around the country, we're seeing some incinerations of conscription centers? I say that because it's just almost impossible to understand for an outsider how depoliticized that population is. And they, they are so depoliticized that we have to be clear that the problem with 50 to 65 percent of Russians, I would say, is not that they are in denial about what's happening um, in Ukraine because they don't have the facts or because they're ignorant. 
they're in denial about it because there's something they can't face. There's something they can't deal with. And so what is that? Why is that happening? I think what's going on is that there's a kind of deal they made with their government over the last 20 years. And they have really built their lives around it. And the deal is, you do politics, we're going to outsource politics to you, Mr. Putin or the Putin regime. And you, in exchange, let us subsist and to a good extent stay out of our private lives. And so that's a thought that basically goes like this. In the end, it's safe. It's okay to outsource politics and think of politics as something that's just going to be going on in a parallel lane, in a parallel universe. That's an okay thing to do. We have fought hard to get the government out of our lives through the Soviet period. I mean, the Soviet experience is perennially an experience of people trying to get a cumbersome and threatening state out of their lives for decades. So people have lived through that and there's a memory of that intergenerationally. And then comes the Putin regime. And the Putin regime is set on two things. The second thing it's set on is intensifying this sense of people being wounded and resentful about the West. But the main thing it sets out to do is to depoliticize the population, is to say, here you go, out you go, you get on with your lives, we're going to do politics. And that's going to be the deal. And people began to feel secure about that arrangement. They've got used to that arrangement. And what they're discovering is that that arrangement, which they thought was safe, has turned into catastrophe, has turned into disaster, and they can't face it. It's almost like you've discovered you're living with somebody who is a really bad person. And it takes a lot of time to wake up to that. And so what they are unable to face isn't the butcher. What they're unable to face is that their idea, their accommodation with politics and their sense of normalcy has been completely smashed. And it's been smashed so brutally that it's very, very difficult to go there and face it. And I think it's going to take an enormous amount for that segment of the population. I call it 50 to 65 percent to wake up. The rest of the population are either for the war or against the war. But that middle bit is just absolutely profoundly depoliticized. So what we're seeing with them is, I would say, one eye opening and they're going back to sleep, but they're going to wake up again soonishly and open an eye again. And then maybe they're going to keep it open a bit longer and then on and go from there. On it'll go from there. In terms of other groups in society, in terms of the civilian elites, so there are thousands of people who work for the Putin regime quite directly in various roles. My feelings that they're in a kind of suicidal slumber and stupor. They can't think straight and they're not listening to themselves even when they talk. And my sense in terms of people who speak to them, who it's possible to then get some feedback from, is that these conversations just go like this. Ooh, I don't know. I can't jump off this boat. I don't have a life in the West. Well, anyway, now I'm going to be in trouble if I go to the West. And maybe it'll pass. Maybe it won't pass. But is there anything I can do? There is nothing to do. So there is there is that kind of sort of situation of them being stuck in the headlights. And then in terms of the sort of super elite, the folks who are a circle or two circles away from Putin, my sense is that nobody's contemplating a coup yet, but they're all strategizing and preparing for a post-Putin future. And in fact, I would say some folks in different regions of Russia are beginning to, for the first time, contemplate not just a post-Putin future, but a future post the Russian state taking the kind of form that it takes. In one of your videos, you used Stalin as an example, saying that uh, as soon as Stalin died, uh, 
it only took a couple years for his old inner circle to completely backpedal on his stances and reverse some of his policies that were unthinkable as long as Stalin was still alive. So for Putin's current, um, like you said, one circle or two circle outs, they're already planning for a post-Putin world, and it might be drastically different with different policies than it currently is. That does, does give me hope a little bit. Now, you've mentioned that Putin's aim the last 20 years has been to depoliticize the general public. He doesn't want people paying attention. He doesn't want people engaging with the state. So now that he's requiring them to serve in the military, he's announced this mobilization. How does Putin get these people to politically support or engage or participate to support this war? What what are his advisors telling him as far as messaging or strategizing to get the uh, general Russian public on board with the war at this point? I think he's talking to himself. Um, I think that it's shocking how isolated he is. Um, there's lots of second-rate journalism, um, which might tell you that there are various kinds of intellectuals behind Putin's project. And recently with the um, bomb attack in Russia, Alexander Dugin, the philosopher, or philosopher in quote marks, has been in the news. Um, the truth is that the only person Putin is ideologically close to is a guy called Yuri Kovalchuk, who is a banker. And he is Putin's only friend, I think, at the moment, when it comes to thinking about these deranged quasi-imperial fantasies. Exactly what they're talking about, we don't know, because the circles have contracted so much. If you go back to before the pandemic and you go to Moscow, it's possible to talk to someone who's talked to someone who's talked to Putin and get a sense of what he's thinking. What is shocking now is that there are hundreds of people who normally have a sense of what Putin is thinking. When you ask them, they say, oh, I don't know, I have no access, I don't have anybody to ask. So there's a real sense of contraction. Nobody knows exactly what is being discussed or who it's being discussed with. But I can only think of one person who is meaningfully an advisor to Putin. That's Kovalchuk. Apart from that, he is perilously isolated. I think that what he is basically balancing is this business of continuing with this policy of keeping the population demobilized, but then the need to mobilize them. And they're completely incompatible demands. And so what we saw when the war began is what I call the kind of fascist turn that Russia took. If you like a totalitarian term, because fascism needs seven or 11 definitions before we get going with that conversation. But I'll Russia took the broadest one. I mean, Russia took a totalitarian turn. That's enough to say, because what happened almost overnight isn't just that all independent media that was remaining went but that there were attempts to unify, they were, they were bitty, piecemeal and limited, but there were attempts to unify the people with the, with the regime and bring them together and create a degree of participation. There was an unbelievably ugly um, deepening of political intervention in the education system. I mean, what that regime is doing to kids is absolutely disgusting at the moment. You know, seven-year-olds are being taught basically Putin's personal delusions about Ukraine, about world history, about Russian history. And kids are being made to arrange themselves in these ghastly Z signs. FSB has been inserting itself into university bureaucracies. So, but that turn only went Part of the way, I would say Russia went 20, 25 percent totalitarian and then kind of virtually stopped and continued maybe drifting in a totalitarian direction, just a, a percentage point per, per few months. And Putin needs to decide, is he going to try to push this further or is he more interested in keeping his population depoliticized? And of course, he wants the best of both worlds, but he's going to have to make very difficult decisions. And you saw that with mobilization. He didn't want to do it now. 
he is not silly and he understood that you needed to politically mobilize the population more before doing military mobilization. My sense is that if things were going well, he would have liked to mobilize a year or two years from now. I think he may have liked to mobilize a year after taking full control over Ukraine, which is revealing, right? This is how I'm thinking about Putin's project. This is not just about Ukraine. It will be about Ukraine because we're going to stop him. But it wasn't about Ukraine to begin with. It's a, it's a bigger pattern of escalation. So he's trying to balance um, basically making Russian, uh, the Russian population fascist citizens or keeping them uh, from being citizens at all. And it's a very, very fragile balance, and he's, gonna, he's having to make decisions he didn't want to. So basically, that's where that's at, and he's going to keep improvising, it seems to me. But I think the trend is more in a totalitarian direction until the whole thing, until the whole thing snaps. And he's scared of that, because when he asks Russians to become citizens and stop being a population, there's every chance that their expression as citizens is going to be bye-bye Mr. Putin, not we're going to be loyal fascist citizens. So that's the dilemma he's basically stuck with. Putin had this annexation rally a couple days ago, and anytime Putin has one of these rallies, there's always speculation, what is he going to say? What is he going to announce? There was speculation he might formally declare war or... Uh, announce martial law or maybe close close the borders, draw back the Iron Curtain. Why do you think Putin hesitated from doing any of those things? I think it's just what we've been saying. He feels that his timings are all, are all wrong. I mean, I would say that the martial law has been sort of semi-declared, if you look at what's happening in the country. But I think that he is all over the place with mobilization. He wants to see how much he can get away with, and then he's going to perhaps try for a second and third wave. And closing the borders feels inevitable to me, or at least closing the borders to certain segments of the population. So it seems to me that the mobilization story was taken off the shelf so quickly that other stuff is behind and they're out of time. But the logic suggests that eventually they're going to need to close close the borders to at least some of the population. Those uh, men ages 18 to 60 more than likely. Or well, men aged In your videos, 18 to 90, yeah. <laughs> 18 to 90. <laughs> In your videos, you've explained that Putin is thinking... He doesn't believe he's at war with Ukraine. And we see this reflected in Russian state TV. They, they, they dismiss Ukraine that it doesn't even exist. They believe that they're in a war with NATO already. And specifically, you've said that Putin believes he's already in a war with the United States. Can you explain your, your thinking on that statement? Well, I think Putin's logic is that you can't be in a war, in a war with a country that doesn't exist. But I think that the basic story there is that Putin wants to recreate the international order without having any clear picture of what change could be realistic, could realistically have come his way, and without even having any clear picture of what that international order that he would like might look like. And that's of a piece with other Russian aspirations. Once you begin to articulate them, they see as being coherent. So he wants to defeat NATO and make NATO either sort of dissolve or become devoid of any efficacy. And he wants to gain significant control over virtually all of Eastern Europe. And that's therefore a case of um, saying that Ukraine for Putin, if he had the capacity, which he doesn't, is just a frontier on a wider pattern of escalation. And that Putin isn't going to stop um, unless he runs out of uh, capacity. Putin does have quite a bit of resentment toward Ukraine. 
But in the end, that's very secondary to his categorization of Ukraine as territory. Um, and it's territory on which there's occurring a dispute between major powers. Um, so there's quite a bit that he's, uh, he's concerned about specifically to do with Ukraine. And that's really about Ukraine not being a democracy. A Ukraine that's a democracy at the time when the Putin regime is fragile is to him simply an existential threat because symbolically, and practically, Ukraine would encourage, Ukraine's existence would encourage the democratic forces in Russia. So that's unacceptable. But beyond that, he is basically trying to break what he calls the unipolar world and trying to take on the West and take on NATO. And it's very important that a lot of his thinking here is kind of mystical and mythological. I wouldn't put this too geopolitically. And I date this back to about 2012 or so, when he began to think in sort of civilizational terms. He began to think of a clash of civilizations. But it wasn't coherent and articulated like Sam Huntington's book about the clash of civilizations was. It's full of various kinds of quotes from Russian fascist thinkers, various kinds of visions, various inheritances from um, religious ideas he has come across. So there is a kind of a, a mystical and quite obscure set of temptations there that take him in the direction of thinking that he is somehow standing up for the unique destiny of Russian civilization and that that today requires him to take on the West and take on NATO. But if you ask me, how do you visualize Putin's ideal world order? What would it look like? Well, except for Putin getting a larger sphere of influence than he has now, it's not really that much to say because I don't think it is a transparent geopolitical aspiration. And that's why it's so hard for us to understand why he's so set on this. There are elements of sort of pseudo-religious mysticism to this stuff. And this is new. Putin was much more of a functionary when he came to office. But things began to change, I think, a year or two before Crimea. And we are seeing that reach uh, quite a new level now. I, I I feel what you're saying because I've read the transcripts. You know, I, I listen to the, the speeches that he gives and he's railing against Western ideals and Western philosophy. But I'm still struggling to understand what is his alternative vision? What is the alternative ideals and alternative philosophy that he's even offering to his own people to follow. Can you like summarize it to make it make sense to me? Because what am, what am I missing? So, I mean, I don't want to be sort of corrosively cynical here, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to be. One of my specialities is 19th century Russian thought. And I can't recognize anything Putin is up to in the intellectual and cultural inheritance uh, that you find um, in Russia's conversations with itself um, across time about its identity, about where it's going. I mean, there are some regimes, some governments that are much more driven by quite coherent, sometimes lovely, sometimes unlovely ideas than they let on. We've had plenty of examples of this. So it's often the case that there are ideas driving various kinds of political projects. Um, in, in Britain, Thatcherism was an example of a project that described itself as not being ideological, but it was immensely ideological and had quite coherent ideological ideas, for instance, about the primacy of the free market. And you could even trace where they were created. But I think that with Putin, what you've got is... And a regime that is genuinely not based on ideas in uh, anything other than just an exploitative sense. And that's why it's not an accident that virtually the only uh, sort of 
intellectual who is trying to defend the Putin regime with big ideas is Alexander Dugin. And Alexander Dugin talks about Ukraine as significant ontological space. You know, and when we look at these young boys from dislocated Russian towns going to Ukraine, engaging in atrocities, stealing frying pans, that is not ontological space, Mr. Dugin. Uh, bullshit. And so what we've got, in my assessment, is Russia turning completely away from Europe, trying to turn completely away from Europe and turn away from European ideas. But that's impossible because all Russia's ideas about itself are in great part European. So Russia turning away from European political ideas, from European ethical ideas, from European cultural resources, is like a dog trying to run away from its tail. That doesn't mean that Russia is just like France or Germany. It's very different. But in the end, Russian literature is a branch on a tree called European literature. Russian political ideas are a branch on a tree called whatever you want to call it, the, the, the intellectual history of the West. So Russia is trying to go into a space that doesn't exist. Often the label that's given to it is Eurasianism and various kinds of Eurasian ideas. But I personally think that that's a geographical classification and that it actually has virtually no cultural or intellectual or political content that's meaningful. So what I am seeing is Russia doing what that penguin did in Werner Herzog's film about the South Pole, when he caught a penguin walking into the interiority of the continent into certain death. Russia is trying to turn away from Europe, and inevitably it will have to turn back to Europe, because all the conversations Russia has ever had with itself in the last 200 years have been significantly based on European ideas. And so for me, this is a regime devoid of ideas, and it's a regime devoid of Russian ideas. Because Russian ideas are European, and it doesn't want to deal with anything that's European. There's a kind of an ideological gambit it likes to play, this regime, which is that it is more European than Europe because it embodies the values of European conservatism. But that, to me, is political technology. And when you look under the bonnet, there isn't any real engagement. There isn't any real engagement with alternative models of modernization that might be more appropriate to Russia than they are to West European countries. So I think there's a real deficit of ideas. There's a kind of ill-assorted porridge of quotes that are Putin's favorite quotes, but I don't see any, I don't see any substance at the level of ideas to what this regime is after. In other words, we could say it's got co coherence, it's got coherent ideas, we just hate them. And I don't think that's true. I think it's, an, it's, it's a regime devoid of ideas. And that's an extraordinary story about cultural and political decay that Russia is going through. So on my channel, I personally have done it. I've drawn parallels between Nazi Germany uh, and, and Russia today parallels between Adolf Hitler and Putin. Do you think drawing those kinds of parallels are appropriate or do you think it's an exaggeration given given history? Well, I think we've we've now spoken long enough. It's definitely time to bring up Hitler. I th I think that there's absolutely nothing wrong with making parallels like that as long as we don't overinflate them. So the key disanalogy is just what we've been talking about, that Russia is still, to a good extent, an authoritarian regime that's 75% based on depoliticization, keeping the citizens passive. When Russia takes more totalitarian steps forward, if it does, and tries to activate the population, tries to sort of zigify the population with this silly emblem that they've created, that's a sort of incomplete swastika, um, then that comparison will be more compelling, especially if we talk about Hitler up until 1939, up until the end of 1939. Um, but even staying at 39 and earlier, there are then important parallels, which we can't deny. I mean, we have got this extraordinary complex 
of you know a sense of humiliation that a great power feels that is then immensely intensified and exploited by political leadership which then offers as a solution aggressive intervention in neighboring sovereign states so this sense of a humiliated power acting out i think is an important parallel and i even think that some biographical parallels there i mean the sort of um emotions hitler was fabricating in himself in the 1920s about how this great power needed to bounce back and teach everybody is the sort of thing putin was feeling um and what's interesting is that putin himself doesn't seem to have benefited from the extraordinary freedoms that gorbachev gave that gave that country doesn't seem to 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 have loved that um he is paranoid about some of the anarchic qualities of russia in the 1990s even though he himself was participating in that in all kinds of ways he is traumatized he shouldn't be but he is traumatized by some western interventions in different parts of the world um the western interventions in yugoslavia sent him nuts and kosovo in particular sent him nuts in my opinion the only thing that sent him more nuts was libya and it's libya that in good part convinced him that he had to get rid of medvedev and come back so there is this kind of biographical connection between hitler in the 20s and putin in the 90s brewing all of this stuff of a humiliated power needing to bounce back and of course even though russia is an authoritarian country there is this other connection which is that you you are talking about countries that basically don't just ban opposition and exclude opposition they see opposition as enemies sponsored by traitors and foreign agents you know so that's a quite a significant overlap too putin sees all opposition as being foes who are sponsored by malign foreign agents and and traitors so there is that too so is putin going to go on and generate large scale camps in which people are going to be exterminated on a on a large scale i suspect not no but i i don't think there's anything illegal about making the comparison i think there are i think there are clear parallels especially if we stop at a certain at a certain historical point you mentioned in one of your videos that if putin manages to stay uh, stay in power even if maybe he's expelled from ukraine you think 10 years from now he'll be more popular in north america and europe in in western democracies than he is today can you uh, expand on that on that claim it's a piece of manipulation on my part which tries to wake wake up my beautiful community a little bit to some of the challenges we face um at home in our countries with our democracies so i think that citizens who are deeply disaffected and have lost trust in democracy and have lost trust in public um institutions have a propensity to engage in that kind of fancy i think even today in the middle of this brutal war there are some countries in europe where putin in the public opinion poll would rank above some prominent national politicians from that country so where i'm coming from with this basically is that i believe that we're facing a crisis of trust in politics in public institutions in democracy that greater than anything that the west has faced probably since the european revolutions of 1848 it's not the biggest political crisis we've faced it's the biggest crisis in trust in my opinion that we've faced and what we've got now is not just citizens feeling that their governments are useless or that their governments are um working against them and betraying them citizens are feeling two more things that are really significant 
one is the the feeling that they can't inflect the direction of their government in any way that there's nothing they can do that can affect the way things are going so there's a real sense of disempowerment a sense of sort of turning the wheel and nothing happening and that's very frightening for citizens for voters and then i think there's something else that's even worse and that's that to many people a kind of opacity has descended on our public institutions they look at our institutions and it's not clear to them what what they're seeing and i often say that the experience to a lot of citizens is like looking at four or five sports games blended into one you know they're seeing cricket bats they're seeing tennis rackets they're seeing table tennis bats but it's not clear that any game is being played with rules that make sense and when you have this feeling of opacity about your institutions i feel the first instinct is to begin giving up on them or to begin getting enamored with people who are gleefully trying to bring them down um i don't want to say too much more but that general sense of loss of trust is where i sort of begin a trail of thought that ends with this somewhat provocative conclusion that Putin might be more popular in the future if he happens to still be in power. In your opinion, at this point, what is the likelihood of Russia falling into some form of civil war? It's real. Because you don't start shifting borders outside of your country especially if you have a kind of imperial shape to your country inside i mean russia has enormous ethnic diversity and cataclysmic inequality um and in fact part of what you are seeing in ukraine just one part of the atrocities you're seeing for me is kind of a kind of um class envy um whereby these boys from depleted russian towns are seeing that ukrainian folks are living better than them that's not the main motivation but i think it's a part of it and i know from time in moscow that when you see the same boys on the streets in moscow when they're brought in by the national guard that does all of the policing the riot policing that happens when they're public events these boys would love to be unleashed on moscow So I actually think what they've done in Ukraine many of them would love to do in Moscow. Moscow is like a country within a country. It 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 contains unbelievable wealth compared to what's going on in the rest of Russia. So you've started shifting borders Mr Putin. You have got half of your population it's different ethnic groups. You've got profound inequalities, profound reasons to resent the center the idea that your borders aren't going to start shifting on the inside mr putin is implausible so i think that one thing i would say is that it is unlikely that russia will stay exactly in its current borders i think there's going to be some border floating and border creep we need to see how far that's going to go i think that nothing can be ruled out at the moment i think a revolution can't be ruled out a coup can't be ruled out and some kind of a civil war can't be ruled out and you know we have seen civil war in the former yugoslavia in the 1990s and that happening on a territory with plenty of nuclear weapons is something you would be able to understand much better than i could um so we're going to have to see how it goes but the ingredients for russia to begin falling apart and for that not to be peaceful are there in my opinion since putin took power over 20 years ago i don't know the numbers but i'm guessing tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of russians have left the country because they don't want to live in putin's regime and these russians living in exile have now been joined by an additional several hundred thousand men avoiding mobilization what advice would you give to all of these russians living outside of russia that would love to see change inside russia what can they be doing while living in 
Turkey or, or, or Finland or England or, or other countries around the world? Well, I would say the first thing is understand the core problem, which is this problem of depoliticization. Um, so don't try to, if you like, enlighten Russians with information. That's going to make them look away even more. So understand what the problem is. The, the problem is an extraordinary kind of depoliticization. And you've got to start having a conversation with Russians inside the country about how they might become citizens and how they might begin coming out of this. And it's a, it's, it's a very painful conversation to have because they're going to be resisting, because they don't want to face that their, their arrangement with the regime has turned out to be catastrophic. So I think it's the first thing. You've got to start there. The second thing is that you need a vision of Russia's future that is beyond just getting rid of the Putin regime. So you need a rich conversation about what kind of a country Russia is going to be, what kind of relationship with Europe it is going to have, what kind of institutions it's going to have, um, how decentralized it is going to be if it continues to exist as a single entity. And that's important because for a lot of uh, anti-Putin, pro-Ukraine Russians, the war is so painful and the atrocities the Russians are committing in Ukraine are so extraordinary that it's just tempting to become a Ukraine activist and a let's defeat Putin activist, which is important. I think that a central part of Russia moving forward is actually Putin being defeated. So that's absolutely correct. But that's not enough, because the, you, especially if you're aspiring to be a future Russia, Russia politician, you need to do more than this kind of activism. You need to have a, a vision of where Russia is going. And there has been a limitation, to put it politely, of that kind in some of the opposition discourse, whereby you ask folks, what is the Russia of the future? And the answer comes back, a normal country. Well, what, what kind of economics do you want for Russia? Normal economics. What kind of relationship should Russia have with the A normal relationship, just like a, you know. No, we need more. So there needs to be that kind of story. And then that links into protest. Because for protest to be viable, people need to see where they're going, why they're going there. And then they need to see protest as a mechanism of getting there. At the moment, there are many extraordinary moral authorities in Russia, above all Alexei Navalny, who is a, an extraordinary hero, whose stock is growing as long as he survives in prison. But to complement that kind of moral example, I think Russia needs a richer conversation about where it's actually got to positively go. And then you have to talk about a political system, you have to talk about economics, you have to talk about decentralization. Sure, it's true that some things, if the Putin regime collapses, could just be improved by an omission to act. The clearest example is the court system. If you simply stopped putting political pressure on the courts, they would, to a good extent, just start working by themselves. Because at the moment, they're completely overweened by political demands. So there are some things that will just start, start working when you remove the tyranny, but that's not going to get you a successful experiment in Russia, um, you know, uh, uh, at least trying to become something like a modern democratic republic. And here is something else I believe here that's really, for me, very important. I think on top of Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, there's another way of seeing what's happening on that ex-Soviet space. And that's to see it as a kind of civil war between two visions, an authoritarian imperialistic vision and the vision of a modern democratic republic. And what Ukraine has remarkably done is consolidated around taking a very clear side there that it wants to be a modern democratic republic. It's going to be challenging to get there, but there's a real commitment now that you can feel in Ukraine. A quarter of the Russian population are committed to this. 
many people in Belarus are committed to, to it because folks in Belarus are much more uh, clearly taken hostage by their regime um, than is the case in, in Russia. In Russia, there's this sort of dance between the population and the regime that's gone badly wrong. And now they're afraid to act. And now the regime is tyrannical and it's hard to do anything. But what I'm saying is that that conflict is happening all over that ex-Soviet space. And so you've got to understand it in these terms too and support this modern democratic republic project. And that means understanding that there are many Russian citizens who feel that the Putin regime is at war with them. Um, and in a certain sense, it is, because if they criticize it, they're going to go to jail or be killed. So that's, I think, some of, the, some of where I would start. And where I'm basically driving is we've got to do more politics, because just taking a firm moral stance, as admirable as that is, and just supporting Ukraine to go ahead and win isn't enough. Solid advice for Russians who have left the country. Well, let's now do a hypothetical. What advice would you give to a lower class working Russian man who chose not to flee mobilization and he was just handed his mobilization papers telling him to report for service tomorrow? What advice would you give that man? Well, not to be in a position where the papers are handed to, to him in the first place. If he is in that position, not to sign them. If he signed them to destroy them, his copy of them, and then to run. Um, I think the, the positive story is that these conscription centers are not the GIU or the FSB. I mean, they've got a couple of 15-year-old computers there. Um, they are completely incompetent. They are just trying to go the path of the least resistance. So what you should do, if you are in that position, is put as many buffers in place to make it harder for them to reach you. That might mean being a guest at somebody's house and not appearing under the addresses that are registered to your name. That might very painfully mean quitting your job if it's a state job or keeping it and working remotely if you particularly trust your employer and it's a small company and, and so on. Um, but I, I think that it's really important to take every kind of evasive action because the odds of beating this system trying to reach you are not that bad because of how extraordinarily incompetent it is. And do not comply. I mean, if, if, if they come to your door, don't open the door. Um, the chances are they will not knock it down. They'll move on to the next person they need to catch. So put in place buffers for it to be hard for you to be reached is, I think, one thing that's really important. But that's just practical advice. I think I'd probably give a couple of other bits of advice. Follow where the mobilization politics is going and act accordingly. So, for instance... There is an inter-clan war now in the regime about mobilization. The military have been given power, which they've never had before. The military has often been trodden on in Russia, and it's the agencies that have had all the power, the FSB and the GIU. So they're enjoying it, but they're now clashing. I mean, the, the military despises the propaganda machine, for instance, because they're constantly being battered by it. The military has now come into conflict with the Moscow authorities because the Moscow authorities are freaking out about the randomness of the mobilization. And so the Moscow mayor is now trying to take control over this. If he succeeds, then that could mean that in Moscow, mobilization is much more procedurally transparent. And if that's the case, that will make it safer to be there and so on. So follow the local political dramas about it. But the third thing I would say is, so long as this regime exists, its telos is war. This is what this regime will do until it collapses, even if Putin becomes skeptical about making war. This regime is a kind of escalation machine, and it will try to make war as long as it exists. And so don't fantasize to a situation where Ukraine has defeated Russia and that chapter has been closed. They're going to mobilize you in two or three years. <laughs> 
So be aware that that's the reality you are facing until this regime collapses. Um, it's important not to have any illusions about this, whatever happens in Ukraine. So that, that, would, be, that would be my advice. Solid advice. You've given me lots to think about uh, from this interview. I greatly appreciate your time. Perhaps we can uh, have you back on the podcast at some point in the future. Do you have any final words, final thoughts, final advice you'd like to share with the audience? I think the thought that I have is that if we allow it, Putin will threaten not just the security of Ukrainians, but the security of all of us. And so every time I've spoken to journalists or newspaper folks since, since I've begun to develop a community on YouTube, and they've asked me what, what should citizens in Western countries know? And you all of you know this better than me watching this channel. So it's useless to say this, but I'll say it anyway. Um, when we face challenges, economic challenges, cost of living challenges that are partly connected to the war, my advice is to see Russia not just as an economic threat to Europe and North America, but as a security threat too. So that means that I'm strongly taking a side and saying, look, we can't say to Poles, well, you guys are intimidated by Russia, and Russia is a security threat to you. But us here in, in France and uh, in Germany, uh, we're not so threatened. Russia constitutes an economic, but not a security threat to us. And so they're kind of two Europes. Some of Europe is threatened by Putin um, at every level. And to the rest of Europe, Putin is just a, kind of a, you know, an economic threat. And I'm against that idea. And I'm for the idea that the West should stick together with this and that Europe, too, should have a conversation about what constitutes Europe. It's having that conversation. It's a divisive and painful conversation. Some of it is not going very well. But the side I take in this conversation is that the West comes together and recognizes that Putin is a threat to all of us not just to countries on Russia's periphery. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is keep supporting Jake's work. Um, and, you know, the, the more you support him, the more he's going to be there for you. I've been doing this thing for a little while, and I know that it's not always easy to run a YouTube channel. These are sort of tricky, tricky waters. And even though Jake is flying so high and he's got a quarter of a million uh, subscribers and is going to go far, far beyond that very soon. It's you know, it's 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 a challenging it's a challenging journey, and it's a journey that's going to have many evolutions. Stay with him, and he will stay with you. I appreciate everyone who has followed me on this journey to this point. If you made it this far in the podcast, you should definitely subscribe to Vlad. Check out some of his content. It's uh, top quality, in my opinion, as far as analysis on Russia and Vladimir Putin specifically. Vlad, thank you so much for your time. Until the next one, take care, be safe.